All right, this is the uh, lecture for logic design for Monday. The, let's see, uh, 14th, November, the, uh, September the 14th. And today, um, what you are supposed to do is you're supposed to work the practice test, uh, which is on Blackboard. And uh, this is test number one, but this is the practice test, so it doesn't count. Uh, it's actually not in the same format that the online test will be. Um, so that's a little bit of a problem. I might work on that, but, but uh, the material is going to be the same. So if you can work this test, then you'll be, you should be fine. Um, yeah, and then probably what I'll do is give you a similar test and then you can you can work the you can you can basically work the work the test uh, that I put up and then uh, and then basically using that you can you can answer the questions that then will be the online test. Um, at least that's I think that's probably what I'll do. I don't know. I may just give you an on, a purely online test too. So we'll see. But but the problems will be very very similar to the uh, to the practice test. And if anything, it'll be uh, it should be a little bit easier. Okay, so if you're watching this video and you have not attempted to work the practice test yet, you'd probably be better off if you did that first. You don't have to, but I think if you try and do the test on your own and then you watch me work it on the video, that will help you. I will also say that uh, before I do the practice test, I'll work a different test. Uh, and so I'll work a different test and then I'll work the practice test. So if you want to watch the the first part of the video where I work the practice test that's not the one you're going to take you can do that and then uh, and then you can work the practice test and then you can come back and finish the video where I work through the actual practice test that I'll put on the uh, on the on the board okay so hopefully that makes sense all right so I'm gonna so I'm gonna briefly put up the syllabus here so we can just make sure we see that so Let's see, I think I think that's maybe already up. So I'm going to shrink this down and maybe even further. And, and then I'm going to, and here it is. So here's the syllabus. So believe it or not, we're, we're, we're working on the fourth week of the semester. There are only 15 weeks. So we've only got 11 weeks left to go, which is amazing to me. I guess that's a little less than three months. So... So we're whaling through this, and uh, and uh, so far, hopefully, you're doing doing okay. So there is um, there is uh, a homework four that's due on the 16th. I'll probably work some problems from that and do review on on Wednesday. Um, but today, I probably won't. And all, but today, during uh, during office hours at noon. Uh, uh, you can come on office hours and ask questions. You can also go to the TA's recitation sections, and um, and in the TA's recitation sections, you definitely should be able to uh, get some help with uh, with problems. Um, and you can also ask him to work uh, some of the test examples. Okay, um, so you should go back and reread units one through four. You should uh, you can go back and read some of the videos if you want. Um, and then, uh, so let me work the first practice test. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to cover before then. Uh, I don't think so. All right, so I'm going to switch. I'm going to take me off. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. Okay, and then let me switch to that. And then expand it again. And we'll hopefully get it. It was focused, and now it's not. How about that? Um, yeah, that's not too bad. Okay, so we'll... Yeah, that's pretty good. Maybe just a little higher. Let's see if we can get this to focus better. Let me focus up here and then maybe it'll be better when it comes down. Oh, man, I don't know. I don't think that... For some reason, my focus just does not work. Oh, that's not too terrible. Okay. All right, something like that. Right, so let me, let me put it somewhat straight. 
All right, now let's adjust this. Perfect. Okay, so first problem. And I'm going to get the right glasses on so I can see it too. All right, so uh, okay, so again, this is not the actual practice test. Um, that's coming up. If you're talking with a customer paying for a system, you, you are talking with a customer paying for a system to test baby rattles by twisting them. One rattle out of 1,000 will be selected to be tested. The customer wants to know the twist angle that the rattle breaks at to plus or minus about three degrees. You plan a twister that uses a shaft encoder driven by a geared down motor and you read the angle when the rattle breaks. When the question, uh, answer the questions about your design. All right, so which one of four shaft encoders do you pick? Uh, and these shaft encoders vary by the number of output bits per reading. So 4 bits, 6 bits, 8 bits, 12 bits. Okay, so what is the basis for picking this, this, uh, this uh, shaft encoder? Well, remember, what the shaft encoder does, it tells you the angle of the shaft. So you start it at, say, 0 degrees, and then as it twists, you keep reading and reading and reading, and when it, when it suddenly breaks, you record that last reading before it flips back into its original position. So you record the maximum reading, essentially. Um, so what are your constraints? Well, basically, the, the main constraint that you have to deal with here is, uh, is it that you need that plus or minus three degrees. I, I'm going to, I'm sorry, it's still driving me crazy. Let me go way up here and then see if that, oh yeah, that's not too bad. So we'll go up here, we'll try this even higher. And then we'll come down. Let's see how that does, and then we'll, we'll make it flat. I don't know my stupid thing. I'm not really very really happy with it. All right. Okay, that's better. A little better anyway. Okay. So, so this is your constraint right here. Three degrees. So since you have to read plus or minus three degrees, uh, and uh, so we didn't, so did we give a, um, yeah, so we, we don't really know. So, I guess we have to assume you could twist all the way around one full circle. Circle. Once you go past the full circle, then uh, then then uh, our shaft encoder starts over anyway. So so what we have to do then we, we have to be able to read every angle between zero and 360 degrees to plus or minus three degrees. That's really the bottom line. Okay. Now so so if that's the case, so so that's. So you could say that's 360 things. Now, why is it not 361? Because remember, we have this business about counting both the beginning point and the end point. And the answer is, for a circle where the end point and the beginning point are the same, you don't have to add one. So when you're going around a full circle, you get to do just the number of degrees. So there are only, we only need, 300, we only need 360 things, uh, but we only need to read it to plus or minus three degrees, so we can take our we can take our uh, 360 degrees and we can divide it by 3. And so that's going to be 120. So we really need 120 different points to be able to read within 3 degrees. Um, okay, so now we need to represent 120 things. Now, what's the what if we do the log base 2 of 120 and round up, what power of 2 is that? Well, we can answer that because we know the powers of 2. We know 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So 128 is, is going to be uh, what? Well, that's 2 to the 7th. So we need, we need something like 7 bits. Well, we've got a shaft encoder that does 4 bits, 6 bits, 8 bits, and 12 bits. 
Well, you need at least seven bits. So six isn't going to cut it. So you have to go with eight. And that's going to be a little better than what you need, but that's fine. But, but those are what are available to you commercially. So, you know, uh, unless you're going to uh, make your own seven bit shaft encoder, you're going to work with an eight bit shaft encoder and that's fine. So, th so that's what we pick, eight bits. Is this sensor considered analog or digital? All right, so don't let this confuse you, but one of the few truly digital sensors out there is, is a shaft encoder. Uh, there are probably some others. Most, most other sensors are actually digital. And what happens is, uh, I mean, sorry, most other sensors are actually analog. And what happens is, as soon as the, the, the signal is sensed, a lot of times we convert it to a digital signal uh, as the very next step. Sometimes we even do that conversion down in the sensor itself so that we transmit to the microprocessor or wherever we're sending the data, we can transmit it in a digital format. And that means that we can do error correction and we can use an error Per, you know, we can use some kind of um, uh, code that helps us uh, minimize the errors. So, so there's a, so there's a couple of reasons why that that's not you know not too bad of a thing. Uh, so, but this is the one few, you know, one of the few truly digital sensors um, that we have. Like a, you know, take for instance a microphone, a temperature sensor. Uh, those are those are all analog quantities, and we turn them into digital digital values. But they, they, we have to do A to D conversion. Um, pressure senses, sensing, same thing. Um, so, yeah. All right. If we had a sensor that, say, uh, determined which, which bin we dropped into out of, say, 10 bins, that would also be pretty inherently digital. But this, this shaft encoder it gives us a digital output. All right. Now, so we can say the sensor actually is considered digital. Most, most would be analog, but this is one that's digital. Could a gray code help reduce errors? So this is one of the things we talk, talked about in, in one of the lectures. One of the, one of the things you actually absolutely have to do with a shaft encoder is to use a gray code. Because if you use a, a straightforward binary, uh, you know, binary number, there'll be times when you'll be changing every bit in an 8-bit code. And that means you, if you're right in between where the, where the bits are flipping and you're not sure whether it's going to read the left hand or the right hand side and be a 1 or a 0, you would actually have uncertainty in every single bit. You would have 8 bits of uncertainty for an 8-bit value. That is complete uncertainty at that point. And because you never know if you're at that point or not, um, that's, that's an unacceptable um, lack of, lack of uh, la that's an unacceptable amount of uncertainty, which means that's very, very bad precision. And of course, if you have terrible precision, you can never have accuracy. Uh, if your precision is bad enough, your accuracy is still going to be bad. Okay, so anyway, um, so can a gray code help reduce errors? Yes, of course it can. Only one bit changes. So that way you can only have plus or minus one bit. If the sensor were far from the computer, what might you do to reduce errors from noise when you send the reading to the computer? Well, you might use an error, error, error reduction code or error detection code, something like that. So, some code that can help us reduce the errors. And there's a lot of different ways that's done. The only one we really talked about specifically was parity, where you make the number of ones in each byte even or odd, and you you append a, an extra bit. So in this case, you'd have to send a ninth bit for every byte uh, to make sure that the uh, that you had an even or an odd number of ones, and that could be called a parity bit. All right. So then we have a little bit of binary math, which I will no doubt uh, give you some of these. This this is super simple. And I'm always astounded by how many students lose points on this question. I always ask something like this. Recently, I've deleted the octal part, so I'm not going to worry about that. But I do want you to be able to take a decimal number and convert it to binary. Now, you're at home, so obviously you can use your calculator. But I would like you to try and do it by hand, and, and, uh, and particularly on the practice test. Um, so uh, 
so generally I'd, I'd, I'd like you to at least do it once by hand and so we'll do that in this case it's 19 so we just do that divide thing so we take 19 and we divide by 2 and this is an unsigned number there's no fractional portion no decimals so 2 divided by 19 so that would be 9 with a remainder of 1 because 2 times 9 is 18 so the remainder is 1 and that would be our first low order digit right there then we divide 9 by 2 and we get 4 with a remainder of 1 there's another one now we divide 4 by 2 we get 2 with a remainder of 0 then we divide 2 we get 1 with a remainder of 0 we divide 1 by 2 we get 0 with a remainder of 1 so this is 9 uh, teen so let's look at it so we have 1 2 4 8 16 16 and 2 is 18 plus 1 is 19 so it checks all right so it's 1 0 0 1 1 and I'll give you something simple like that 1 0 0 1 1 now we want to write this in hex now here's where it's really really easy you start from where the decimal point is and you work left and then you work right there's nothing to the right so you don't have to worry about it working left you go one two three four and you group those and then you continue one and then you pad with zeros and so so this is going to be uh, the hex number here is one and the hex number here is zero zero one one or three so our hex is 13 that's our hex number the decimal number is 19 the binary number is one zero zero one one and the hex number is 13, 1, 3 hex. And you, you don't have to write the 0x in, but if you want to, you can. 0x13. All right, and that's usually how we write our hex numbers, 0x13. And you'll use this probably the rest of your life if you work in, with computers or anything digital, which everything's digital now, so you're probably going to use this. All right, now we're given a binary number, which I've scribbled over, 1101010. So, uh, let me switch that over. One one zero one zero one zero. One one zero one zero one zero. And that was correct, right? One one zero one zero one zero. Okay. So here's our number. Now we just have to work it out. Remember, it's powers of two. We start from the decimal point, which there's no fractional portion, which makes your life easy. So that's one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. 64. So it's 64 plus 32 plus 8 plus 2. So so 32 and 8 is 40, 64 and 40 is 104, and 2 is 106. Okay? We know it has to be an even number because the 1 bit is not, not a 1, it's a 0. So 106. So the decimal answer here is 106. What about the hex answer? You do the same thing. You count 1, 2, 3, 4, draw a line, 1, 2, 3, pad with 1, 0. And so I'll do it on the back here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, draw a line, 1, 2, 3, draw a line. Okay, the first digit here, 0, 1, 1, 0, that is 6. And you should be able to do all these 4-bit values. You should have committed to memory now. And if you don't, take time. Take time in the next, you know, today, tonight, tomorrow, and memorize these so you've got this down cold. And then 1010 is A. So this answer is 6A hex, or 0x 6A. So you pop this in over here. 0x 6A. And then... Our last one, oh, sorry, we have this one, uh, AD.8. A. Now, this does have a fractional portion, AD.8. A. So how are we going to convert that? So AD.8. A. So, so we can write the values here. So we do, um, we start from the decimal point and work left. So this is uh, D times 16 to the 0, and this is A times 16 to the 1. So that works out to be 10 times 16 plus D is 12. Right? No, sorry, D is 13. So it's 10 times 16 or 160 plus 13. That's our integer portion. 
173 point and then what about our a well so that's times 16 to the minus 1 or it's a over 16 or you can write that 10 over 16 decimal and uh, and so 10 sixteenths, 5 eighths so it's 173 and 5 eighths or if you want to divide it out um, it's uh, 4 eighths is a half so 0.5 plus 1 to 5 so that's 0 0.625 so that's 173.625 or if you wanted to write 10 sixteenths that's fine too all right so that's that one so so what did I say 173 and uh, 0.625 And then how about the binary? Well, the binary is pretty easy. We're just going to change these. So we'll, a, so we'll start here. Decimal point D is uh, 1101. A is 1010. And point A is 1010. So that's our binary number. We just, we just do 4 bits and 4 bits. And then 4 bits go in that way. Another reason why you should definitely be able to convert 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F into 4 bit values. F being 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 being 0, 0, 0, 0, and everything in between. Okay, so now, um, all right, so that does this table. Um, oh, let's see, I didn't do that. Uh, yeah, there it is. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. So 1010101.1010. You can obviously drop the, the trailing zero. And so that's, that's uh, well, it's 5 eighths is what it is. 101. Uh, that's a half, that's a quarter, that's an eighth. So it's 5 eighths. Okay. Um, so that's that. Make sure you work on some of these numbers. Um, yeah, I mean, I prefer you to try it without the calculator, but uh, I won't be there to watch. So, okay, now uh, we have a little bit of binary math. And again, I, I'll probably ask you a little bit of this, but this is really straightforward. Um, and so let me, I'm going to write this so I can write a little bit bigger. So let me write this down. So this is 11001101.001. Zero, zero, 001 and we're going to subtract from that we're going to subtract from that um, zero, 010.11001.001 zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero. so we're going to subtract that okay so here we go so now remember how I told you to do this so 0 from 1 is 1, 1 from 0, nothing there, nothing there. So you're now you're going to borrow that, that 1 and you're going to put a 0 there. You put a 2 here, but you're going to borrow 1 from that 2, so you put a 1, and that will put a 2 here. 1 from the 2 is 1, 0 from the 1 is 1. 1 from 0, you can't do it, so you have to borrow this one, put a 0 there. A 2 here, we're going to borrow 1 from that, so that will leave a 1, and a 2 here. 1 from 2 is 1. 1 from 1 is 0. 0 from 0 is 0. 1 from 1 is 0. 0 from 0 is 0. 1 from 0, you got to borrow that. That's a 2. 1 from 2 is 1. Uh, 1 from 0, got to borrow that. That's a 2. 1 from 2 is 1. So the correct answer is 11001.111. One, one, zero, 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 one, one, one. Okay? All right. And I think I have... I think I have the answer is posted for this, uh, but you can kind of work, you can write them down as we go. All right, the multiplication problem. This was super simple, um, and let me, let me grab another sheet of paper. So the multiplication problem is really, really pretty straightforward. Remember, there's only two possibilities. You either write zeros or you write, or you write the multiplicand. Those are the only two options for each partial product. Every partial product is either zeros or the multiple can. And all you have to do is index correctly. All right? So the first, 
since our multiplier has a 1 in the first position, we, we copy the multiple can. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. The next is 0, so we'll put a 0 there, and all zeros. The next is a 0, so we'll have another set of zeros. You try and keep them lined up so you don't screw up. And then we have a 1. So 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then we have another one. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. And the last is all 0, so we will not even write it. And now we just add up the partial products. 1, 0, 1, 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 is 0, carry your 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry your 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1, carry your 1. 1, carry your 1. 0, carry your 1, 1. And that's what we get. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. All right, and hopefully I did that correctly. And then finally, um, convert 35 decimal to a 7-bit 2's complement number, which would be equivalent to minus 35 in, in, in decimal. But we want it in binary and 2's complement form. So the way we do this is the first thing we do, we, uh, we find out what the binary number is for 35. And then we need to make sure that 35 is going to, that plus and minus 35 is going to fit into 7 bits. And uh, it should, hopefully, we'll just check that out. So, uh, so let's first do 35. So we take 35, divide by 2. So 2 into 35, uh, so 16, 17. So it's 17, remainder 1. 17 doubled would be 30, uh, 34, plus 1 is 35. Okay, that sounds good. All right, then 2 into 17. So that would be 8, remainder 1. So we put, a, we put a 1 here and another 1 there. Those are our low order bits. 2 into 8 is 4, with a remainder of 0. 2 into 4 is 2, remainder of 0. 2 into 2 is 1, remainder of 0. And 2 into 1 is 0, remainder 1. So 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, OK? So that's 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Now, is that 7 bits? No. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's only 5 bits, so 6, 7. So we pad it out to 7 bits. Now, first off, let's, let's just try and remember what are, what's the biggest, uh, the biggest positive number and the smallest negative number we can fit in 2's complement form in 7 bits. Well, so... So first of all, how many, what's the biggest unsigned number we can fit in 7 bits? Well, that would be 2 to the 7th, okay? So 2 to the 7th, what is 2 to the 7th? Well, 2 to the 7th is 128, okay? So we know it's going to be about half this. So that's basically going to be minus 64 to plus 63. Remember that we do have 64 negative numbers, minus 1 to minus 64, and 64 positive numbers, 0 to 63. We have 64 positive and 64 negative, but, be, but because we count 0 on the positive side, we wind up short 1 on the positive side, or 1 more on the negative, however you want to look at it. So, looking this, we, we definitely see 35 and plus and minus 35 will fit easily and nicely into 7 bits. So we're good. Okay. So when we padded it out, now all we have to do, this is positive 35. Now we just have to take the 2's complement. And the 2's complement, you can invert every bit and add 1. Or you can copy bits till you get to the first one, copy that, and flip every other bit, which is really easier for humans. So we'll copy bits. So we'll copy the first one and then flip every bit after that. So 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And this then becomes the representation for minus 35. Notice that the higher order bit is a 1, 
which we always expect in two's complement form, even though the higher order bit is not really a sign bit, but it will always be zero if it's a positive number and one if it's a negative number, unless you've overflowed your capacity, and in that case, all bets are off. Okay, now we want to prove this equation. So this is really pretty straightforward. I don't know if I'll give you this exact problem, or I won't give you this exact problem. I don't know if I'll give you a problem just like this. I'll, I, I might. I'll think about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I might, I, might, I might do that. We'll see. But in any event, um, what I want you to do here is, I, so, so we have a truth table with three independent variables, x, y, z. And I have a whole bunch of columns over here that are basically different representations of x, y, and z so that, so that I can build... I can build up this this original expression, and it and it and what we're asking is is x y prime plus z equal to z plus x quantity times z plus y prime. Well, if you know if you remember your first your sorry if you remember your second distributive law, you know instantly that yes indeed that is that is correct, that is the right answer. So you're not really too worried about it, but. Uh, uh, so you, so it should work out. But the way we're going to prove it with a true table is we're going to show that we're going to eventually come up with a column that is the right side, x, y prime plus z, and a column that is the left side. Or sorry, the left side and the right side. Is z plus x, z quantity z plus x times quantity z plus y prime. And if these columns have exactly the same value for all possible values of x, y, and z, then we know that we've proven that this expression is true. And we're going to build it up by doing these little things rather than just do these two columns because that will help us not to make a mistake. So the first one, we're going to do x, y prime. x ended with y prime. So uh, clearly where x is 0, this will be 0. So I know this, 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 and this all have to be zeros. Now what about here? x is a 1, y is 0, then for y prime is a 1, so that actually is a 1. Y, 1 ended with 1 is a 1. Here, same thing. And then here, y is now 1, so y prime is a 0, so these are going to be zeros, even though x is, is, is a 1. Okay, so that's this column. Now this or is a little easier. Wherever we have a, a, z, a 1 for z, it's going to be 1, or where we have a 1 for x, it's going to be a 1. It's only going to be 0 where both x and z are 0. So x is 0, z is 0, so that's one place. Clearly a 1 here, clearly a 1 there, clearly a 1 here. Oh, wait, uh, sorry. X and Z are both 0 here. I missed a 0. Here is a 1. And then here, all the next four, X is 1, so these are all 1s. So we only have a couple of zeros, And that's where both X and Z are 0. Z, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so that checks. All right, now what about z or y prime? Well, so, so that would be anywhere z is a 1, it's going to be a 1. So that's every other 1. So 1, 1, 1, 1. And anywhere y prime is a 1, so that means anywhere where y is a 0. y is a 0 here, here, but we already got a 1. It's a 1 there. It's a 0 here. I'm sorry, so we got a 1 there. And then it's 0 here, but we already got a 1. And then... Here, y is a 1, so this will be a 0, and this will be a 0. Now, uh, now we're going to take this column or z. Well, we already know z is a 1 every other 1, so it's 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. And then let's see if there's any place where we, we can add a 1. Yeah, x, y prime is a 1 here, and it's also a 1 there, but we already have a 1, so we're good. And then, now we want to take these two columns and and them together to get this. So 0 and with 1 is a 0. 1 and with 1 is a 1. 0 and with 0 is a 0. 1 and with 1 is a 1. 1 and with 1 is a 1. 1 and with 1 is a 1. 1 and with 0 is a 0. And 1 and with 1 is a 1. And then we should fill in the zeros here. And now we compare the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And for every row, which means every possible value of x, y, and z, 1, 
one, one, one. Yeah, they all equal. So since these are equal, then uh, then uh, it indicates that this is true. So so since for for all values of x, y, and z, left side equals right side. Okay. Now we have De Morgan's laws, and uh, we we I don't know that we've worked any problems with these yet, so this will be a little bit new to you. Well, we did we did lecture on it, we covered it in lecture, but all right. So here we have x prime y prime, and we're going to invert this quantity. Well, we invert the variables in the operator. So remember, there's a an and there's an and operator here, so that's going to become an or. So that's going to be x or with y, and the primes go away. Here. We have x or with y, and, and we're going to invert that. So we're going to add the primes and change the operator, and that's going to be x prime, y prime, which is really what we had here. And now we have this. This is a little bit trickier. The quantity a, b, or with c, and we're going to invert the whole thing. So remember, we have to maintain order of precedence here. So, so we can do it in stages if you want. It may help a little bit, but let's let's do that. Let's so we'll say, we're so let's just treat let's let uh, We'll let z be the quantity a, b. So we'll rewrite this z plus c inverted. And that's just going to be z prime, c prime. Now we're going to invert, we're going to replace this z, and that's just going to be the quantity a, b prime, c prime. Now let's take this invert in here and invert this. Well, when you invert a and with b, you get a prime or with b prime. So that's just going to be a prime or with b prime times c prime. Now you must preserve these parentheses because if you take them off you wind up with a prime plus b prime c prime and that's not the same thing as this. So you have to keep the parentheses. That's why that's that's the critical thing. Alright, factor to POS and show work. So we look at this. First, can we simplify it? Well, we have an x and a, a w. We have a y and a z. There's really no shared variables at all. So the only thing we can really do here is we can use the second distributive law. Can't factor anything else, so we'll use the second distributive law. We'll let this be x, this be yz, or yz prime. And so, so that's going to be uh, w prime x prime plus y quantity times w prime x prime plus z. Now now we've got the same thing only now y will be x and z will be x and we're going to use the second distributive law on this part and then we'll use it all over again on this part which will give us this will turn into two things quantity y plus w prime times quantity y plus z, x prime and this will turn into things z plus w prime quantity times z plus x prime. So our final answer will be equals um, w prime plus y quantity x prime plus y quantity z, uh, well, I'm switching around, z plus w prime quantity and z plus x prime quantity. Four terms. Okay? Now, uh, draw the logic diagram for AG, maybe I'll do it on a different piece of paper. Draw the logic diagram for uh, for A G prime plus A prime C plus A D plus G equals F. Okay. So so what do we have? We have one, two, three, two input AND gates. And we have one OR gate with the output of this AND gate, this AND gate, this AND gate, and this single variable going in. So a four input OR gate. I'm just going to draw the AND gates right here, make it easy for myself. Don't need one here. And I'll have an OR gate here. And that's F. And there you have it. Okay. And then the last one is simplify uh, simplify this. AG prime plus AC plus AD plus GF. 
which is what we just did up here, interestingly enough. Well, so I notice that I can factor, I notice I can factor an A out. And in fact, even better than that, since I have just a G here, I can get rid of the G prime there using the X plus X Y prime equals X. Uh, sorry, um, I did that wrong x plus x prime y equals x plus y. Okay, so using that I can drop the g prime and so then that gives me a plus a prime c plus a d plus g. Well if I have an a and an a d I can drop this and if I have an a and an a c prime I can drop the a prime that just leaves me with a plus c plus g. Okay. All right. Now, page two. Okay. So it looks like I'm only going to get through this one. So uh, what I'll probably do is is a. Uh, I'll probably post the answers to the practice test uh, on Blackboard so you can see them, and then I'll work through it. Uh, I'll work through it on Wednesday maybe. Um, all right. So answer the following question. Does two's complement have two representations for zero? All right, so we, we talked about this. And if you remember, the pro one of the problems with one's complement and the problem with sine and magnitude representations for sine numbers is that they both have two representations for zero. But two's complement only has one representation for zero. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but I, I'm going to do this again because I think this is cool. Let's let's take the representation for for zero, okay? So uh, say we'll take it in in eight bits: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, well, that's 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 an eight-bit representation for zero. Now let's make the now let's now you go well. Maybe is there a two's complement representation for zero? Okay, let's take the two's complement. How do we do that? Well, we'll use the we'll use the computer method, or we can use the human method. The human method is copy every bit till you get to the first one. Mm, let's see. You never have a one, so you'd copy all zeros and you wouldn't and you and you'd have exactly this. But let's do it the computer way. Invert every bit and add one. Let's do that. So we get one, 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 plus one. That's zero carrier one, 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 zero, and you have a carry bit of one. Okay? Well, remember in two's complement math we ignore carries. So forget that. So now what do you have? What you started with. There is no, there is not two representations for zero and two's complement. And that is amazing in some ways to me. It's like, okay, that's cool. And but it's also a great result because now we don't have to help our mathematical uh, machines uh, compensate for the fact that there are two representations for zero, which really screws everything up. It's just a big mess. So um, remember in sine magnitude, there's plus and minus zero, and in one complement, there's plus and minus zero. It's terrible. So, uh, so that's why we use two's complement. Okay. Convert this equivalence gate into an exclusive OR gate. Well, if you remember, the the exclusive OR gate, or sometimes people call it the exclusive NOR gate, and the equivalence gate are considered to be are, they're exactly the same thing. Okay. So so all we have to do to get an exclusive OR, uh, so all we have to and and they're the inverse of the exclusive OR gate. So all we have to do is put an inverter on the output, and now you've got an exclusive OR gate. What do you call a design technique that involves breaking a problem down into identical sub-blocks, designing one of the sub-blocks, and then combining these into the final design by just daisy-chaining them together? We call that design by iteration. Once we have our initial design, we just iterate copies of it until we uh, get the number of bits we want. All right, now this one, a lot of people makes this make some really stupid errors on it, and this is this is really important to think. Just keep your brain on. Don't panic. 
And I don't know if I'll give you something like this. I might give you an exclusive OR gate. I might give you an AND gate. But, but look, I put some inverters on some of these inputs. And I want you to fill out the truth table. Now, uh, obviously, this part's easy because it's just our standard uh, independent variables here. And we always do it in hierarchical order in straight binary order. So we start with 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. All right, so, so let's fill out F. So if you put in a zero and a zero and a zero, then before the bubble, these would be these would turn into ones after the inverters. So you get a one before the bubble and you get a zero after the bubble, right? So that's so that's gonna so that's gonna be f is zero. What about if c is a one? If c is a one, you're clearly gonna get a one before the bubble and a zero after the bubble. So now as you start to do it, okay, so what about what about um, where B is a where C is zero and B is a one, but A is a zero. Well, there's still a one here. There's a, there's a zero here, a zero here, but a one here, because zero before the before the inverter becomes one after the inverter, and one zero zero going into an OR gate gives a one before the bubble, but after the bubble it's a zero. So that's still a zero. What about this one? Um, uh, a, B, C. Well, A is still 0, so that's still a 1, a 1, and a 0, so no change. What about 1, 0, 0? Well, now we have a 1 here, a 0 here, and a 0 here. Well, this 0 gives you a 0, this 0 gives you a 1, this 1 gives you a 0. So we've got a 1, 0, 1, 0, so we get a 1 before the bubble and a 0 after. What about here? 1, 0, 1. So a is 1, B is 0, C is 1. C is a 1? Okay, so then that's a 1 before the bubble, a 0 after. So that's still 0. What about A, B, C? Like this, 1, 1, 0. Okay, this is a 1, comes it becomes a 0 after the bubble after the inverter. This is a 1, it's a 0 after the inverter. And this C is already a 0. So now we have 0, 0, 0. So if you put three zeros into an OR gate, a 3 input OR gate, you get a 0 before the bubble. And after the bubble, you get a 1. So this is a 1. And then, of course, if they're all 1s, you're going to get a 0 because uh, these, uh, these, let's see, let me make sure. Yeah, because, uh, oh, because C is, is a 1. C is a 1, and so you get a 1 before the bubble and a 0 after. So if you see, our, our truth table shows there's only one place where we have a 1. And that's where all three inputs after these inverters are zero, which really would be A prime B prime C. That would be um, sorry, that would be A B C prime. A B C prime, yeah. And that would be that's that's obviously row six, um, starting with zero. Okay, so anyway, so you see we just have one one. So then that, that fills out the truth table. And if we wanted to write that in shorthand notation, we would say F equals the sum of the min terms uh, 1. Uh, sorry, uh, 6. Okay, just min term 6. That's it. All right, uh, let's do these conversions. And then uh, let me do this because I want to get this done. We're going to run out of time here. Um, so... So first off, let me do the last problem. This last problem is is that iterative design we did. Only here we're doing we're pretending that we have the whole truth table. So we have we have inputs for a. So we have a3, a2, a1, and a0. We have b3, b2, b1, and b0, and we have carry in. And we're going to get out some three, some two, some one, some zero, and a carry out. So the carry out will be the higher order here, and then we'll do carry out. 3, 2, 1, 0 for sum. All right. Now, what this is showing us, we have how many input variables again? 1, 2, 3 bits of A. 1, 2, 3, uh, sorry, 4 bits of A, 4 bits of B, and a carry in. So that's 4 plus 4 plus 1, that's 9. So we have 2 to the ninth rows in this truth table, but I've only shown you 4 of them. So what I, what I want you to do with this problem is add these things up and tell me what the correct outputs are for, for carry out and a sum. 
Well, to do that, you just have to do the math. And I'll just work a couple of them, but it's pretty straightforward. So, so let's let me copy the I'll copy the I'll copy the B's here and I'll slide it over. So one one zero one. I'll put it line it up here under the A's, and then I'll the carry in is a one. So now we do the add. One plus one plus one is one carrier one. One plus one is zero carrier one. Zero carrier one. One carrier one. So that's going to be a carry out of one and an S three of one zero zero and S zero is a one. Let's do the next one. So here we have the same thing. Uh, I'll copy. I'll copy the B's. Well, I'll copy the B's. Zero one zero zero. And I'll copy the uh, carry in. And then we're going to add it to the four bits of A here. Okay. So we have zero plus zero plus one is one. One, one plus zero is one. one. Zero plus one is one. And zero plus zero is zero with a carry out of zero. And so that's going to be zero, zero, one, one, one. So you can see how I'm doing that. It's really straightforward. And then uh, one of the questions is, explain how this could be used if subtract B from A by adding additional logic. Oh, sorry, I, you maybe couldn't see that. I hope you could. I, I don't know, anyway, by adding additional logic to the adder, additional logic gates. Well, all you have to do is you just have to put inverters on the B. And you put a 1 in to carry in. So that's inverting B and adding 1. So that makes B a 2's complement. And as long as it fits, as long as you're, you're not using... Uh, and remember, in, in 4 bits, you can put in minus 8 to plus 7. That's what's legal in 4 bits. Unsigned, you can go from 0 to, 16, uh, to 15. 0 to 15. But signed, 2's complement minus... Minus eight to plus seven. So as long as our numbers are are in this range, we can we can do this math and we'll be okay. If they're bigger than minus eight or plus seven, we're going to overflow. Okay. Um, all right. So let's just do these. Let me do these these other these problems here. Okay. So so this is in POS form. I I probably have room to do work them here. So notice we have an A prime here. We have an A prime there. We have an A prime there. So we're just going to get rid of that term and that term. They're gone. <coughs> and that leaves us with B prime plus D quantity times A prime. B prime plus D quantity times A prime. So we just use the first distributive law and we distribute the A in it and we get A prime B prime plus A prime D. Okay. Now let's look at this one. Um, so we have x, y, z, y prime, z prime, x prime, y prime, z, and x, z. Well, <clears throat> we have an x, z here with a y in between, so that's fine. So we can drop that term completely. And then do we have a y prime, z prime anywhere? No, we don't. Okay, so, but we do have a uh, x prime, y prime, z term, and an x, z term. So we can actually drop this uh x prime there. And that gives us this y prime z, so actually, uh, sorry, that gives us y prime z prime and y prime z, so we can combine those into y prime, and that gives us y prime plus x z. Use the second distributive law, and we're going to get y prime uh, plus x quantity times y prime plus z. So that's the answer. Now this one we have AC plus AC prime, so those combine to A. We have CD prime plus CD, those combine to C. And that just gives us AC. And that is in SOP, RPOS form, take your pick. Okay, um, and then we'll do this one. Using the truth table, write the minimum expansion and then consider don't cares and get the simplest solution. Hint, you'll have to work it twice with the don't cares. Now, if you could do this with k-maps, it's easier. You can just see the solution. But without k-maps, you've just got to do it twice. Okay, so so this is the, what we looked at on Friday. How do we how do we write the min term solution for this truth table? And they and they ask us, uh, yeah, they want us to do with min term, the min term expansion. So we have to write all the terms out. 
All right, so I'm going to do this on another piece of paper. So but let's let's look at it here. Okay, so so where are the ones? So we have a one here, a one there, a one here, and a one there. So if we count the don't care as a zero initially, we can write we can write our solution. We can say f equals a prime b c prime plus here a prime b c plus here a b prime c not a prime just a b prime c and then finally a b c now remember we can use these multiple times if we want we can combine this and this and we can get a c we can combine this and this and we can get a prime b the c will drop and then we can't really do much so our final solution is a b a prime b plus a c all right now let's do it again but we'll take this as a one so we have to do just what we did but we can add this term up here which so that would be f equals i'll just rewrite all these terms a prime b c prime plus a prime b c plus a b prime c plus a b c plus a prime b prime c prime now a prime b prime c prime can be combined with with this term here to get a prime c prime and then we can combine uh, these two and get ac just like we did and we can combine uh, we can combine uh, these two and get uh, uh, a prime b so our final answer here would be a prime b plus uh, a c plus a prime c prime now it looks like uh, that that this has an extra term so what that means is we would not want to choose our don't care as a one we'd want to choose it as zero to make it simpler now I just want to make sure that I did this correctly so I'm going to do a, a truth table I mean a K map so you can see how this would look and basically it's X 0 1 1 0 1 0 1 so one term two terms and the don't care yeah you should take it as a zero so that's right and if you don't then you have to loop it like that okay so that's correct so our so the answer there then would be would be that uh, pick the best value for the don't care zero and the simplification a prime b plus a c and the other one is a prime b plus a c plus uh, a prime c prime okay so that's it so we worked through the test and it took us an hour five no it took us uh, sorry 58 minutes okay I'm gonna quit there um, and I'll, I'll I'll make sure I post uh, the solution of the practice test you can still work it on Monday and then I'll, I'll, I'll work it I'll try and go through it a little bit faster on uh, Wednesday all right so let's see let me put my smiling face back up okay and okay okay so hopefully hopefully that was helpful um, and um, if you have questions come to the uh, so, so I'm gonna post this this is Friday night I'm gonna post this over the weekend um, so if you have questions you can come to the zoom link uh, at noon on uh, Monday on office hours and you can ask questions and I'll uh, I'll also maybe maybe work maybe spend a little time working the practice test then too uh, all right we will see you next week or see you Wednesday or whatever